Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Darren Griffith. I am the coordinator based out of Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I cover five stakes in Kentucky, and that includes Southern Illinois and Northwestern Tennessee. Uh, and love it. I've been working for the church for 26 years, I think, something like that, teaching seminaries and institute classes. Love it. Have a great time doing it. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to get to know everyone who's on here for a moment. Uh, to, after the prayer, we'll tell you your name, how long you've had your calling. For some of you, that might be less than a week, and for others, it might be years. And then just one word that describes your feeling as a teacher. Like if you just got a calling, you might be surprised or nervous or... Uh, what other adjective you want to use to describe that? But can I have someone volunteer to say a prayer, please, and bring the Spirit in to help us all? Just wave your hand, and I'll say you. Someone has to wave. There we go. Chris from Tennessee, will you say our prayer, please? Thank you. Our dear, kind, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be gathered here as followers of Thee, and we're grateful for Thy desire for us to share the gospel and create a, a relationship with Jesus Christ that these kids need so badly in this world today. We pray, Heavenly Father, for um, our leader that is leading us today, that he will feel thy spirit and create a, an atmosphere of security and peace as we share about ourselves and our fears and, and joys and our new calling. We pray for our minds and hearts to be open to his message that he has so diligently prepared. We say this in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. You assumed a lot when you said I diligently prepared, but I'll give you, I'll, uh, I'll take it. I thought you'd like that. Yeah, that was great. Okay, uh, today's topic is know each learner's name, circumstances, and learning needs. And by the way, these topics for out the summer, we didn't make these up. Uh, these come from Salt Lake, uh, topics that they feel that we as teachers need to make some improvements on that's kind of a focus for us. So that's why we have this one. So names are important. So we're going to get to know everyone's name in here. And there'll be a quiz. Uh, your salvation will be based upon how well you do or how good looking your grandkids are. Either one, you choose. So no, we'll just have some fun with this. So Chris, since you said our prayer, you gotta go first. Name, where you teach, how long you've been teaching and uh, one adjective that described your calling. My name is Chris Word. I'm from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And um, this is my first time in seminary teaching, I've taught all the other um, places, but not seminary. When I was called, I um, was overwhelmed with fear and um, told them that, are you sure that this wasn't um, perspiration and not inspiration? Desperation. <laughs> Oh, desperation. <laughs> well, that was one of the reasons I gave him that I couldn't do this calling because a year and a half ago, I was uh, two days away from dying from a brain bleed. So I've had to have a whole year of recovery. And I said, you know, I've got that and I've got this. And, no, 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 Heavenly Father. So sounds like Jonah. You can't run from it. The Lord wants you. Right. He put you there. Thanks, Chris. I tried. <laughs> Love it. Roxy, how about you? Hi, I'm Roxy Newsom. I'm uh, from Georgia, Augusta, Georgia State. And I teach a hybrid class where half of my students are online and half are in person because our ward covers a huge uh, area. Some of my kids live an hour and a half away um, from me. Uh, so how long I, are you teaching in one word? Okay, this is my year this time around. Uh, back when my kids were teenagers, I taught for four years, but that was like 18 years ago. Um, my one word would be, I love it, love. I like it. Good words. 
Julia, how about you? Or Julie? Hi, um, I am the Winston-Salem, North Carolina stake. Um, I have a son that lives in Lexington, actually Sadieville. <laughs> um, and um, this is my fourth year teaching. It's not consecutive though. I taught when my son was in seminary. Uh, I taught um, for three that year and uh, it became apparent that if I continued to teach, he was not gonna graduate. So <laughs> it released me. <laughs> And then I, I got called again. So this is my third consecutive year, four years total. Um, so I still have not hit all four books. Um, and if I had to, when I was first called, I would say terrified. Um, four years in, um, I would say relentlessly giddy. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I hope, I hope they just sort of forget about me and leave me and let me go on my lane. <laughs> yeah, most people I talk to, this is the calling that they cry when they get it and they cry when they leave it. Yes. It doesn't happen with most, but it's fun. No. Sally, how about you? Uh, I'm a seminary supervisor in the Goldsboro, North Carolina state, and this is my fifth year. So I actually don't teach the students, but I do visit the classes and try to get to know some of the students. Uh, we have amazing teachers in our state and we're going through some growing pains with the online seminary. Um, I taught seminary back in the eighties, so you can tell I'm a little older, but- um, I like it. I guess I have been humbled <laughs> uh, by this experience with trying to learn all the technology. <laughs> I like it. Thank you for sharing. Heidi, how about you? I'm Heidi. I am in, in the Wilmington, North Carolina stake. I teach uh, kind of the hybrid nature of my class is that I have um, kids from two different wards because in in our ward we have kids that go to different uh school districts and so um i teach kids that go to the one school district the, the pender county schools and so i cover both the Hampstead and the holly ridge wards um i've been teaching this will be again consecutively this i just finished my second year consecutively i taught um years ago. Funnily, I never did teach my own kids. I taught before my, I taught when my kids were too little to be in seminary. And I taught when my kids were already graduated from seminary. So, um, and the one word I um, agree, I would be forget. I want them to forget I exist. Just leave me here. I tell people that all the time, just forget I exist, leave me here. And, you know, and just know that I, I don't ever want another calling. Make me smile. Thank you. Jenny, how about you? Hi, Jenny Shannon from the Gainesville, Florida stake. And this, I'm going into my sixth year consecutively of teaching seminary. And my word to sum all of it up is joy. I absolutely love the youth and they bring joy to my heart. And I always hope to bring just a little bit of joy into their life every morning just by being, just by being with them. I love it. Love it. Notice fear was the word used for the brand new. And then Jenny brings us to joy. Well, thank you, Jenny. That's a great one. We'll all get to joy here soon. Candace. Hi, I'm Candace Townsend. Um, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and I actually taught the last five weeks of the last semester. Um, online seminary and I am transitioning and actually teaching with my husband early morning seminary starting this next semester so I'm excited to not be exclusively on canvas this year I'm really happy about that <laughs> so what's the one word that described when you first got your calling um inadequate <laughs> very nervous yeah I think there's some empathy in the room for that yeah Love that. Leah. Hey, I'm Leah Thompson. I'm from Ocala, Florida. I'm in the, the o Ocala, Florida stake. Um, I've taught 
like 12 years now, but this time around, like in many different places between Institute and seminary, this time it's been five years consecutive. Um, I think my word is enthusiastic. When I found out, I was like, yes, I was so excited. Now, was that the first time or was that the most recent time? The very first time. Oh, and the most, every time I'm always like, yes, I love it. So that's a great one. And you pronounce it Leah? Leah, yes. Got it. Thank you. Dane, how about you? Hello, everyone. Yes, um, I'm Dane Woodruff. I'm from the uh, McMinnville uh, Ward, McMinnville State in um, Tennessee. And uh, my, my wife and I are uh, called to this position. My The one word I have is uh, irony. You know, uh, my, it seems like my whole life has been ironic. I, uh, here I am, a black man serving in the south of the mission. Uh, I come on my calling. I just retired and was ready to take it easy. And then they said, <laughs> gee, I'll, why don't you just serve uh, in seminary? Um, I'm, in the, I'm in the scared stage right now because this is my first year, really, of the one on my own doing it. Uh, Thank God I have my wife to help me. And um, But to me... I look at the youth as the youth are our future in this country. So what what seminary has done for me has given me hope for this world, basically, knowing that we're going to have some good youth out there and put some good youth out there in this world that will take care of all the mess that will that will happen. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> You're anticipating a giant mess. That's funny. <laughs> True. I've read the Book of Mormon. I know what happens next. Thanks, Dane. Caesar. Hi. You're muted now, Caesar. You were on a second ago. Try it again. How's that? Perfect. Okay. okay. I'm Caesar Gonzalez, and I am in Graniteville, South Carolina. Um, we we have two wars that we teach, so it's uh. Um, Augusta North and North Augusta, I'm sorry, North Augusta Ward and Granville Ward. And um, so I team teach with another teacher that comes from the, um, the North Augusta um, Ward. And he's, he's 83 and I'm 66. And we were not the first choices. So that it's kind of interesting. But, you know, like I taught my kids and in, in when we were going through DNC, is that if someone doesn't step up, the Lord will call somebody else. So, you know, and that's just the way it goes. And I, I was very apprehensive when I first received the call. It was kind of like me, seminary teacher. And, um, and the funny thing about it is I've been um, promising the Lord that I was going to do better. I was going to do better. And so this is his way of saying, okay, you didn't do it, but you didn't do better on your own. Now I'm going to help you out. And which is great. This has been great. It's been incredible. This is so. This is the completion of my first year, and uh, we really, really um, enjoy teaching. Uh, Brother Cap, um, who I teach with, he's a sealer in the temple. I'm an ordinance worker, and Brother Cap was uh, um, a seminary teacher years ago, and we just, you know, together we really complement each other, and the kids, you know, with, even with Brother Cap being as old as he is, the kids love him. And we've had a fantastic year and a very successful year. And it's just been great. And we, we love the youth and we know how important it is um, to fulfill this calling the Lord's given us. And what could be better than teaching the gospel five days a week? I love it. That's awesome. Love it. Brenda. And then if anyone else wants to join that has uh, your camera off, turn your camera on and I'll call on you. But Brenda, you're next. Hi, I'm Brenda Martin from uh, Montgomery, Alabama Stake. I live in Magnolia, Alabama. I've been, I was called five months ago. I have one student. And even though I only have one, I'm still overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Yeah, that's a word I hear often as well. Thank you for sharing that. That's great. April, how about you? Good morning. Um, I am in the Memphis North Stake. And I got this call about a week and a half ago, almost two weeks, I guess, and overwhelmed. 
Thank you for sharing. Anyone else who hasn't shared yet that would like wants to share? You guys are great. Again, let me just restate. This topic today is know each learner's name, their circumstances, and their learning needs. So let's just talk about names for a minute. Sometimes a name, name says something, right? Like Cesar Gonzalez probably tells me that a little bit about him and his heritage. Maybe not much. Caesar, where are you from? Or where is your parents? Where are your parents from? Uh, my parents were originally from Texas, but um, they moved to Michigan when they were kids, and that's where they met. Yeah, see, Gonzalez screams Michigan, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lo love it. Love it. And Heidi, it says Johnson Taylor, which probably says you're married, right? I am. Yep. Names say something. But I want you to think about why it's important to know your students' names and really what that means. So let's just ponder for a moment. What was the first thing when Joseph Smith went in the sacred grove and God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared? What was the first word they spoke? You guys remember? They called Joseph by name. Yeah. So what was the first word? Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. There's a power when someone calls your name. I mean, I've been to church where someone or meetings and someone goes, hey, brother, come here. And, you know, we use brother and sister because we can't remember what their real name is. <laughs> right. But in this case, there's a power when you call your student's name. Now, some of you, I mean, I mean, one student, some of you will have a, a larger class. So most of us are somewhere in the middle. Right. But I want you to think about the power of knowing someone's name their circumstance, a little bit about them, and what their learning needs are. So if you uh, get a piece of paper or something, you can write down some notes and thoughts. I'll share a bunch of ideas, and then I'll let you guys share uh, anything that you want to share, and we can do a little brainstorming together here. But really, all, all this is, when we care about someone's name, their circumstances, and their learning, we're just screaming that we love them. So I'm going to put a quote up for you. I love this quote. This is Elder Holland. And uh, he said, if, st and students, I added here, if students are unresponsive, maybe you can teach them, you can't teach them yet, but you can love them. And if you love them today, maybe you can teach them tomorrow. Now, obviously, we hope and the ideal is your students show up on that very first day and they're ready to learn and you're ready to teach and you're ready to have a great experience. But sometimes students aren't there yet. They're just in a mental or, or a state where they're just not wanting to learn. But we can love them. And that was uh, Enzyme, June 2007. So that's May General Conference. So think about it, How, loving your students. It sounds easy, but sometimes it's not so uh, easy. But there are some things we can do. So I'm going to break this up into three ways and three areas you can do. One is before school starts. Then we'll share some ideas of what you can do during school, like during class. And then the third one is what can you do outside of class? So let's brainstorm for a moment. What can you do to get to know your students, their names, their circumstances, their learning environments before school even begins? Someone want to unmute and uh, share what the first thing that comes to your mind was? Or you can put it in the chat, either one. Um, we have the parents fill out a card that lets us know what their food allergies are because we eat, feed them and they will come. Um, and we, um, you know, we get some information, their birthday and all that kind of stuff, nicknames. And then we ask the parents to tell us something great about their kid so that we go into class already knowing something positive about each kid in the class. Excellent. So you give the parents a card to fill out love it write that down everyone that's there's some great things you can do get some information from parents uh, 
here's a question you might want to add if you're doing something similar. Is, what would you have me know about your son or daughter that would help me bring them closer to the Savior? And that was wordy, so let me say it again. Yeah, ask a parent. What would you have me know about your son or daughter that would help me bring them closer to the Savior? Notice, I'm focusing it on the student and the Savior. I'm bringing both in together in the same conversation. Love the idea. Talking to parents can be very, very helpful. Now, some of you are like, I don't even know who my students are. Anybody share an idea? What can you do to get to know who your students are before school even starts? Anyone have a thought, an idea, or something you've done in the past? You know, <clears throat> excuse me, for me, um, especially the ones that are coming into seminary or they're brand new to seminary, but I make a personal visit during the summertime to that, that child and at least one parent or both parents together. Love it. So a home visit. Make a visit. But what if you don't know who your students are? Anybody? Well, oh. No, please go ahead. No, I was going to say, I actually visit all my students before school starts, even the ones that are that are repeats. Um, but I just work with the bishops to get with them to know who's, who are the upcoming students. And again, if you're crossing ward boundaries or, you know, seminary is a state calling for a reason, right? Talk with your stake supervisor. They can work with the high councilman. They can work with bishops and see if you can identify a list of students before school starts. Love it. Leah. Um, one thing we do before, we've done it during the summer before, and then sometimes during the school year, we'll just have like a class party and invite all the kids that are in the class, even ones that aren't really regular attenders, uh, attendees, whatever. And we just kind of play games, kind of getting to know them on like more of a social level. I know that seminary is not the activity arm of the church, but I've found that it really brings a lot of like unity to our class. And they feel like I love them because I want to spend time with them even outside of class. That's great. Uh, there's uh, so some kind of a seminary kickoff. Yeah. And just some thoughts and ideas. There's lots of ways you can do that. You can do that uh, after church on a Sunday, talk with ward council, get them to approve it and buy it and see the value of that. Another way is it's not the activity arm, but you know who the activity arm is. It's the Aaronic priesthood, and, which is the bishop and the young women's president. Talk with them and say, hey, can we have a seminary kickoff the Wednesday night or mutual night? Well, we retired mutual. Young women's and young men's night the week before or two weeks before. Schedule it, put it on the calendar. Most of the time, they're grateful for great ideas, right? And just say, hey, I'll come in and do it. And then maybe you can invite some students who just graduated last year that might not have left for school or missions or they're still home. Maybe someone like that can come share teach and testify or invite those who will be returning juniors and seniors love it it's a great idea someone else have an idea please go ahead there sorry one other thing we're doing and honestly i don't know how successful it's being but like our Institute and seminary coordinator suggested that we are like using an app and trying to continue our daily scripture study that we used to do at the beginning of our class every every day in class. We're trying to do it over the summer. So at the beginning of the week, we tell them, hey, here's the come follow reading, come follow me reading for the week. Here's breaking it down per day. And then we have like a chat where we like, you know, ask a question and they all respond and answer their thoughts. So it's kind of like trying to encourage them to keep doing their reading and us stay connected during the summer. That's great. You know, I, I love that. Notice some of us are thinking the first day of school, but, and I know seminary is not year round, but your students still should be studying year round, right? Uh, I have a seminary teacher in Western Kentucky that last summer, his class just met all summer long. They just came to his house and he had a half a dozen boys and uh, they just kind of studied, come follow me throughout the summer. Now, is that an expectation or a requirement or even something I'm asking you to do? No, but see, the point is I want to help these kids keep studying year round. His kids asked him for it. Like, can we just keep meeting? He's like, sure, come over to my house. We'll have breakfast and talk about the scriptures each day. 
So again, it's the culture. It's, it's seminary is not just a class. Seminary is a, uh, helping me with my uh, daily scripture study. Love it. I also have a lot of um, summer birthdays. And as someone who has a summer birthday, um, you know, they kind of get lost. You know, they get a lot of attention during the school year. The one, you know, we make them stand on a chair and wear the hat and sing happy birthday. Um, but the summer birthdays get lost. And so I think if you can pay attention to their birthday during the summer, that means something probably more than it does to the kids during the school year. I love it. That's a great idea. Uh, find out what their favorite cake or ice cream is and take them some. I mean, uh, go to your coordinator or your stake supervisor and say, hey, can I have a, a, some money, a budget? They'll reimburse you for things like that. If they won't, ask nicely. But those are great things because that's building that environment of love and respect and purpose. And it will help kids want to come to class and feel like they belong. Again, if someone doesn't feel like they belong, they don't show up. People don't come to church because they don't feel like they belong. There are a lot of people that come to church just because of the social aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Some come to church just for the doctrine. Well, what's ideal is when you have both. You have that deep doctrinal testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And you get to come hang out with friends and people you love and they love you. The more that there is a sense of belonging, the more those kids come. And the more they'll have a good experience when they do show up. There might be some kids that come because mom and dad make them. There might be some kids come because they feel obligated or bishop or young women's president said, go to seminary. But if you can help create that environment of, hey, this is where I belong. We're all friends here. This is a safe environment where we can talk and share about things. You'll have them come and want to stay. Here's a list of things you can send. And you can do this the first day of class. Now, I'm really hesitant on the first day of school. I really don't want my first day of school and seminary to be like everyone else's first day at school. First day of school, kids hate. It's, it's the rules and regulation day. They go and they hear every class rule. They sign all of this. You're making an agreement that you'll obey by these rules. Most teenagers hate the first day of school, the classroom, because it's all rules and regulations. They love the social. So let's not make our seminary class the first day a day of rules. Make it a day of, hey, you belong here. We love you. But it's okay to ask some questions. I love role questions. And I don't just do this on the first day. I do this throughout the year. I, I have someone in my class presidency or a class secretary take the role every day. And I give them a role question. I love favorites. What's your favorite ice cream? Just... Say your favorite ice cream, you go down, and that's how you take roll. Susie, Chris, Roxy, Julie, Sally, Heidi, Jenny, Candace, Leah, Dane, Caesar, Ren. I mean, you just, what's your favorite ice cream? You say it, you take roll. It literally takes seconds, but you get to know them a lot better, and you find some interesting things. So can everyone in the chat write down a favorite question? Like, what is your favorite ice cream? What is a topic that would be fun, fast, and easy for a kid to do? Let's make a nice little list in the chat here, and I'll read them out loud so everyone can hear. I'll give you a minute to do that. And then those are fun ones, and then you can get more spiritual too. Like, hey, if you could go on a mission anywhere, where would you go? That's a great question. You'll learn a lot about somebody. Somebody might say, I want to go stateside because I don't want to learn a language. I think that would be too hard. I mean, you can learn a lot about somebody who says that. Or what temple, if you could go, if you could get married in any temple in the world, what temple would you choose? And a short reason why would be fun. Someone might say, well, I want to get married in the Detroit, Michigan temple. Why? Well, because families, my parents are from Michigan. Or I want to get married in New Zealand because that sounds really cool. Or someplace fun like that. Those are fun ones. Okay, I'm, I'm looking in the chat now. I'm going to read some of these, what they say here. What is your favorite time of the day? That's an interesting question. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, favorite movie. That's a great one. April, you can find out a lot about what kind of movies they like. Or maybe movie genre. You can do that one too. 
Uh, what is your favorite dream vacation? That's a great one. What is something that makes you smile? That's an interesting one. I haven't done that one. I'm going to write that one down. What is something that makes you smile? What is your favorite sport or hobby? Love that. What is your favorite food? Love it. You could get specific or you could say uh, type of food, right? Like Mexican food or Chinese food or Italian food. Those are great. You could give any gift. If you could have any gift of the spirit, what would you choose? Love that one. You can even bring in the savior to that question and say, what gift of the spirit do you feel the savior would have you pray for? Then it's not you choosing, it's what do you feel the savior would have you have? That's a, a question skill that you can use and work on all year long is take a really, really good question and just bring the savior into it. What's your favorite book? Favorite musician, favorite squishy food, fun. I like that uh, little detail in there. It adds a lot. Favorite place. What is your favorite thing about your best friend? What do you want to be when you graduate from school? Great questions. Love that one. Anyone else want to add anything else? Just blurt it out real quick. like what you said. Love that one. Okay, so those are some things you can do during the school year, but there's some things you can do outside of class, outside of school, seminary, institute, right? Uh, a thank you note in the mail goes a long ways. Kids don't get much physical mail anymore, right? It's all texting, which it's appropriate to text a student, but we're not supposed to have a one-on-one -on -one private relationship. So just include parents in the text. That's an easy thing to do. Or a group text. Or um, have a class presidency text a student. Uh, I'm a big, huge proponent of class presidencies. So let me share a couple of reasons why. Uh, don't make it your class because then they feel like they're visiting your class. Make it feel like it's their class. The best way for that to happen is get out of the way. No, I said that really harsh, but I really mean that kindness and loving. Don't stand up in the front of the room. Go sit over in the side. Have a class president stand up. Instead of you telling what cool things you found in the scriptures that week, have them do it. You know, you hear it in sacrament meeting all the time. Is, I learn more. I'll learn more from this talk than you will. Of course, because you do the work. So if you want your students to learn more than you, which I hope you want them to learn more than you, have them do the work. So students learn in different ways. Actually, all people learn in different ways. You know, I can learn from a hymn. I can learn from reading. I can learn from sharing. But maybe there's a way I like to learn more than others. For example, some students love to talk. Some don't. That's okay. Now, both can learn from talking but maybe they have a method that they prefer. So when you're in class, you can ask, or you can talk with them private, say, would you rather, and I like these things, would you rather stand up and share, or would you rather write your thoughts and feelings and share it in paper? Because some are really good writers. They'd rather do that. Let them choose. Now, I would say, give everyone the opportunity to do both at different times. But there might be a time when you're like, okay, I'm going to have everyone write down an answer to this question that you put on the board. And you'll read some of the questions or others would rather just get up and talk. Some might would ra rather share in a video. Like if someone uh, needs to do it, they missed a few days that you need to get caught up, they need to make it. Would you rather write down what you've dis discovered? Or would you rather stand up and share with the class? Or would you rather make a video and just send it to me of what you learned? Give them some choices. You'll learn the different ways people like to learn by just asking, getting to know them better. I have, a, I have three kids and through academic testing, we've learned that they have three different learning styles. And so watching my own kids has been a real education for me, especially my kinesthetic learner. And um, it, was, it was fascinating when she was five years old she couldn't sing the alphabet song. She would leave letters out. Um, she would, 
she could tell you she wanted something that was round and red and it bounced and she couldn't pull out the word ball. Um, and so that's when we got her tested and, and found out that she was a kinesthetic learner and we had to help her in very physical ways and incorporate some things into her classroom experience. And so it's been really interesting for me as a teacher, as I observe the different learnings, I can identify them now, the different learning styles in my class. Um, I've got one kid who is a kinesthetic kid and he gets up and he marches kind of back and forth. And um, we've, we've got it now where the kids are accepting of that and understand that this is his learning style. Um, a lot of times we allow him to either chew gum or sit on a beanbag chair somewhere he can munch around. So he's got movement and the information goes in. If he doesn't have the movement, the information doesn't go in. Um, so it's been really interesting and in talking with his mother um, to, to learn what he's actually picking up and taking home to conversations at home. Love it. Love it. You can incorporate a lot of weight. Now, there's a lot of research on that, on learning styles. Research shows that every student can learn in every way. Some just have preferable methods. Some of you, a lot of seminary teachers and institute teachers love to give talks. Other people, they fear that more than death, right? But everyone can do it. But, so it's nice to have a variety of things. I love that. Here's a few other things that might be helpful. Uh, incorporate special dates. Uh, we mentioned birthdays, especially summer birthdays, what we were talking about. But on a special day, yeah, boy, have someone in your class presidency be in charge of birthdays. Here's what I always do. I always have a president, and I have two counselors and a secretary. My secretary is always my most responsible, maybe a quiet person, because to bring that person into the class, they get to take role. They're responsible, yet they can ask a role question. Even my quiet, shy people can usually say, roll time. What's your favorite color? And they mark the role. President and two counselors take turns. Uh, conducting class. I always have them start class. Announcements. What's going on for young women's or young men's this week? Simple to do. I always have, and then do that first and then start with a devotional. I always have one in charge of birthdays and one in charge of devotionals. If I have a big class, I might have somebody else do birthdays, somebody else do devotionals. And those three just take turns conducting. Get the kids involved. Learn who's really good at that. You know, if you're like, I don't even know who my class is. Again, go talk with Bishop and Young Women's President. Say, who's going to be in my class? And I would ask those two specifically, who should be my class president this year? You'll gain some insights because bishops and young women's presidents may say, I want the first assistant to the bishop or the young women's president, the girl, right, to be your class president. Or they might say, nope, they're already busy. Let's give somebody else an opportunity. And then all you have to do is approve the name of the bishop. It's not a calling. It's just an assignment. And then you just go talk with the girl or the young man and say, I'd like you to be the class president this year. What can you, we do? And then ask his or her opinion to help everyone in the class feel welcome and loved and invited. So you're inviting them to class and now you have a class president inviting them to class. And then you can either choose the two counselors or I always ask the president, who should be your counselors? And then let's get the presidency to go out and make visits and welcome everybody to class. And on day one, they're the ones in front of the class, welcoming the students, shaking hands, whatever they're doing, right? It's great. That takes a little bit of work before the first day of school, but the more you do to get that presidency prepared, you know their names and abilities, the, it'll save you hours of work later on the road because it's their class. A couple of other ideas for you. Student spotlights are fun. You can have the class presidency spotlight students. Or if you have a really big class, call somebody else. Say, your job is to spotlight a student. Every Monday, we're going to do a student spotlight. Find out what their favorite candy bar is. Buy a candy bar. Give it to them a candy bar as you spotlight them. I mean, there's lots of ways to do that. Now, you might be saying, we're spending a lot of time focusing on students. And like even in today's class, I spent a significant portion of this discussion here getting to know you. I hope I could just state it so clearly that you that you can feel this you can't overdo that you can't over share how much you love a student and care about a student it's impossible now you might say 
you take too much time to do that and not enough time in the scriptures, but it will pay dividends. Okay, a couple of you got noise feedback, so I'm muting a couple of you here. I still love you. I just don't want the noise feedback. So spend time to get to know your students. So I'm going to show you a little video clip. And as you watch this video clip, think, okay, what might that look like in my class? And could I do something similar? Or might I do it a little bit different? Johnny, how are you? Welcome. Mary, hey, how are you doing? Good. good to see you today. Hey, Jared, how are you doing? I'm good. Welcome. Hi, Ben. How are you, my friend? Hey, Hi. Ashley, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Great. I, I've been waiting for you. Oh. I remember you have your soccer game. How did it go? Oh, I was so nervous about it, but it actually ended up going really well. We won two to one, I believe. Whoa, congratulations. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad it went well. Well, let's get started, everyone. Welcome. Great, good. Jan, I love your koala bear keychain. Thank you. Tell me about him. My older sister went to Australia on her mission. So when she was finished, my family and I went to go pick her up and I got it there. What was your favorite part of visiting the mission? Well, we got to meet a lot of the families that she taught. And even though I didn't understand everything that was going on, I got to see how much she loved them and how much they loved her. What an amazing experience. Okay. Tell me what you saw that was good or something you might do different. I don't care which answer, but we just watched that. Tell me what you saw. Can a couple of you share? Wave your hand. Students, students that showed up on time. <laughs> okay, yeah, Julie, that's kind of funny, right? But notice, what was he doing when they did show up? You know, my teaching partner was really good at this last year. She could stop mid-sentence and welcome somebody by name as they walked in the room, even if it was 15 minutes late. They, everyone was identified every day. Yeah, love that. Now, if you want to know student circumstances, a lot of times we blame that student for walking in late, right? But from my experience, half the time it's not their fault. Uh-huh. It's really, so we, let's find out the true circumstance and maybe right when they walk in is not the right time to do it, but maybe it's after class. Hey, you came in a little late. Is everything okay at home? Oh yeah. My mom was running behind. It might be mom or my ride was late or I just slept in. I had a student, this is a true story. I had a student that came to class late and then was putting their head down and just look beat up every day. I found out that this kid was working a night job to help, it was just him and his mom, to help pay the rent. Boy, I treated that kid a little bit different than some slacker teenager who was walking in and acting tired of my class, right? But I love that. I love that. Okay, what else did you see in the videos? Like eye contact with them, um, saying their names, asking about activities and things they're doing. Yep. I know how important you think your lesson is, but your lesson is not the most important thing that's going to happen in class that day. Ouch. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about names, and one of the things that happened organically this last year um, was the kids kind of gave each other nicknames, um, not derogatory ones, but like when we did uh, church history, we have a student whose name is Arthur, and we did sort of this thing on government. And the kids started calling him King Arthur. Um, this last, you know, first last semester, we had one kid who got dubbed Moses. And so it's been interesting that they have a seminary name. Now, even outside of class, when the kids call him by that name, it's, it's kind of like they're in, a, they're in the club, you know? Fun. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Shoot, how, do, how, how do you, as, as a new person, because we're new in the ward too, so how do I learn? What's the best way that you know for me to learn their names? 
Uh, that's a great quest question. Do you, Chris, do you have any idea of how many people, how many students you're going to have? 21. Yeah, that's a big group. Uh, someone want to give a thought? Some of you who have had experience? I do. <laughs> Go for it. I, uh, when I was first called my, the, um, this time, I taught uh, totally online. And it was kids from all over the state that couldn't attend early morning seminary for whatever reason. And so I only knew like two of the kids in my class <laughs> because the rest were from throughout the state. So I made an appointment after I was called to get to, to go to each child's house and get to know them. And this, this took me about a month, you know, to hit everybody up in my free time and stuff. But uh, that was the best thing I ever did because I got to meet them in their home environment where they were comfortable. I got to see some of their hobbies, the things they loved. They really opened up about things. And, and I asked them um, too, what did they hope to get out of seminary and what could I do to make seminary a good experience for them? Now, most of them said, I don't know, just it's fine. But I really had one student who said, I want to know how to make the scriptures be relevant to what I'm doing today. And how does that apply to me today? And, I, and so I took what he said and I tried really hard um, that this last year to, to bring that into relevant today situations. You know, and, and the one the one thing I remember is when we were talking about Samson, you know, uh, we have a, a problem here in our school district. And I'm, I don't know, maybe it's your worldwide or whatever, where um, the students are like, if you love me, you'll send me a nude selfie of yourself. And so that's and then that gets shared with everybody. So we talked about if you love me you know, you'll do this or you'll do that um, because that's what Samson was happening with Delilah. If you love me, you'll tell me where your strength comes from. If you love me, you'll tell me, you know, and she kept begging and begging until he finally did it. And, and so I could liken that to what is happening in their school life and with their peers. And, and so I just felt like going to their home and talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, they they told me things that maybe they wouldn't say in front of their peers. Uh, Roxy, thank you for sharing that. I think there's some value in there. And Chris, uh, I hope you heard something in there that might be helpful for you. Uh, your circumstances might be a little bit different. But yeah, I think uh, you have time on your side now. You spent 21 days and just do one home a day. Uh, you would learn more about a youth by walking into their home or not being allowed into their home like you're at the doorstep and they that's where you're as far as you're going to get take them a candy bar uh just say hey i'm going to be the seminary teacher this this uh school year i'm really excited to get to know you and ask a couple good questions uh you will learn something from roxy there that sometimes teenagers won't answer questions you have to ask the question in the mindset of a teenager just retweet <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely open it. And plus, there's the whole, uh, there's a difference between well, how can I help you? I don't know. Versus, uh, tell me about your current scripture study. Oh, that's a good question. That, that answers a lot because they, oh, I don't know. I don't have anything going on. Or, or what do you struggle most about with scriptures? You might be able to find some things. You, you work out the right one. Leah. Talking about like belong, feeling a sense of belonging in the class. I don't think it just comes from us. Like you're saying, getting like the class presidency involved. But another thing we did this last year, which the kids both loved and hated, but every week we changed where everybody sat and we gave them time every day to talk to a partner, asking those same kind of questions, like, you know, favorite kind of things or whatever. So they could get to know someone else in the class. Um, and I feel like it really helped there'd be like less clicks in the class because everyone wasn't, everyone wasn't always sitting by their little group. Um, and it helped everyone get to know everybody. Um, and then another thing we did like the very first week of school is we let like each kid interview another kid 
and then present that that new friend to the class so it kind of like we got to learn about each other but they also got to kind of like connect with each other that way love so that was ideas. helpful yeah love the ideas now when i taught seminary out west and i had release time i'd have 180 kids day one and i didn't have any way to know who they were until day one right so i didn't have some of the luxuries that you had i would let them choose their seat the first time and then I'd make a little, I'd get a piece of paper and I'd draw on the, like all the seats and then I'd write their names on it and I would memorize name, face, name, face. I love the picture idea. Someone put that in the chat. Uh, and then I know if, cause I let them sit where they want. I know who shouldn't be sitting next to each other. It was real fast to figure that one out. Then my next time I'd have my class presidency. I said, go home and pray about who should sit, who should sit where. And then I would tell them, guys, the class presidency prayed about your seating assignment. This is not me assigning it. So notice I totally took it away from myself. And the class presidency, okay, here's your new seats. And then I'd rotate every month. Sometimes weekly can be helpful. I love that idea. Just say, hey, guys, and then you have to train them. Don't act disappointed in your seating assignment. Because the person you're sitting next to might feel that you're disappointed that they're sitting next to you. And I would teach them that principle. Plus, when you learn circumstances, there are certain people that need to sit in certain seats. Maybe you have a student that's hard of hearing or can't see the board, and they really need to be up front. So you ask those types of questions, and that's helpful. And sometimes we you might often, be a mom. You might we often not, sorry, we often also rearrange the actual room. I mean, you know, we don't have rows we usually have them in a the u but sometimes we push all the tables together we push all the chairs we get rid of the tables we're constantly changing the room setup love it and don't be afraid to move that room around if it's called the relief society room remember they're only using it for 50 minutes you're using it for five hours politely explain that to the ward council i, I would be a little direct in that say i need this room set up this way because i'm in there five hours this week if someone's in there longer than that, let me know and we'll let them have control of the room setup. A lot of times we adapt for other people, but we need to be a little a little bit of bold on that one. I would anyway. Of course, that's my personality. As, as far as, sorry, as far as room setup goes, um, something that just kind of organically happened in our class. So we did, we because we did four days of seminary for an hour each. Um, this past semester because we had some kids that had to drive siblings to school and things like that. But what, so every Thursday after class, we met in the primary room and I had tables. We'd have, you know, at the beginning of the year, I was kind of still trying to socially distance them as best I could. So we had two kids per table and, um, and on Thursday after class, they would clean up the tables and, and put them all away. And then it turned out that, and then on Monday mornings, I would go in and set up the room. And, um, and one of the moms noticed one morning, she's like, are you doing this all yourself? And I said, yeah. So, you know, that's fine. You know, they, it just didn't even dawn on me to, to ask any other, other way, but um, the kids actually got together that every, so in our ward, the Holly Ridge ward is the one that meets second in our building. And so my kids that were in that ward would, as soon as church was over, they would go set up the class every, every, um, every Sunday afternoon. So they, again, it was kind of like an organic thing that they did, but it, it meant so much to me and they, but because they did that, they were able to, they would make little changes here and there. Sometimes some days they'd set up the tables so that they were like little tiny tables so that, you know, they wouldn't set them up. So they were all the way high. They'd, and then they'd put like the, the small little primary chairs around and stuff like they, and I would just let them do kind of whatever, whatever worked for them. And because they kind of gave them buy-in and how the, how the room was set up. Love it. And if you have a class presidency, that can be their responsibility. If you just as a, an idea, I love it. And someone put in the chat there, who was it? April asked, how would you suggest choosing a class presidency? Uh, again, talk with Bishop and, and young women's president. I'd go that direction. Let them help you make the decision. And if you know the kids well, you can submit a name like Bishop, I'd like so and so to be the class president. Is that okay with you and counsel with him? Uh, again, counsel with the young women's president too. I love it. You guys have shared some really great ideas. I hope you've written down a few things, be inspired. You may have had a thought that's completely uh, different than what we've shared today, but that's the power of this. The point is, 
you really need to get to know your students, know their names, know their circumstances, let them know you love them and that this is their class, that they belong. And you're just there to help guide that um, discussion. Now in the chat, I put the link to where I'm gonna put this recording if you wanna look at it later and for all of the other ones. Right now there's only one in there. And there's a few other things in the chat, check out. We're gonna have a closing prayer now and I'm gonna turn off the recording. And if you want to stay and visit longer, you can stay as long as you'd like. Otherwise, you can go and have a great summer. I'll be teaching next week, too, on uh, Tuesday, just for a little bit of fun. Let's have a closing prayer. Uh, someone want to volunteer? Caesar, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be in this service to help the youth, we're grateful for our callings and for our families and their support. We're grateful, Father, for the scriptures and for the wonderful things that contain therein that provide the information that we need to go about our lives and to return into thy presence. We ask thee, please, that thy spirit will be upon us and with us as we teach the youth that we will rely heavily upon that and that we will use thy guidance to do things according to thy will. And thank you so much for all the seminary teachers who are willing to put forth the effort and to teach the youth. May they be blessed. May we all be blessed according to thy will. We humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.